Ron? Okay, we're going to get back to uh, with the rest of the symposium. And I'd like to thank you all for attending and participating. Um, and the next speaker is someone I really admire because he's tackling an, a question that I think is, uh, is largely, I won't say ignored, but you don't consider it. For example, if you're eating a yogurt in Paris with the lactobacillus uh, acidophilus, how do you know if it's the same acidophilus that if you're eating a yogurt in, in uh, San Francisco? You don't. And you don't know if there's any benefit. You don't even know if the organisms are alive. So Scott's been, who works about two to three miles from where I'm sitting right now, has been a real leader in the developing of standards for the microbiome, for microbiome research and product development. This is critical. And I think we were all gratified in seeing the National Institute of Standards and Technology take leadership in this area. So Scott, we look forward to your talk and thank you for being a part of this. All right, thanks Howard for that very nice introduction and thanks to uh, Sabine and others for organizing this. I've been looking forward to it and uh, it certainly hasn't disappointed. Really great talks from the first speakers. So uh, as Howard mentioned, um, I am with, at NIST and I often feel obligated to introduce NIST because I didn't know what NIST was until I started working at NIST. <laughs> Uh, NIST is a non-regulatory federal government agency in the Department of Commerce. <clears throat> We've got uh, our headquarters just outside of Washington, D.C. in Gaithersburg, where I am right now. Uh, but we also have another campus in Boulder, Colorado. We're about 5,000 strong scientists and engineers. Um, we're the oldest federal technical institute in the United States, uh, over 100 years old, about a billion dollar annual budget. And usually when I say technical institute, in the Department of Commerce, I get some weird looks, like why does the Department of Commerce need a technical institute? But our mission is to promote uh, measurement science and industrial competitiveness by, by advancing measurement science standards and technologies. So, uh, you know, we really see industry and in promoting technology and translating technology as, as um, what we strive for. Okay. So, related to that, um, the, the, the industry connection. So in the last 10 years, we've witnessed an explosion of new biotech and biopharma companies that are all targeting the, the human microbiome in some way. Um, you know, you heard from a couple of companies this morning, um, Ceres and others that are developing the next new modality of drugs, which are live bacteria, but also companies that are uh, exploring diagnostic uh, type um, services and things like this. So um, it's it's a hugely growing industry, and uh, there's there's a lot of promise behind it, and there's a lot of um, confidence in that uh, these these things will eventually come to fruition. So uh, last night when I was putting this together, I did a quick uh, search on clinicaltrials.gov uh, for gut microbiome, and there were 13 about 1,300 studies uh, underway that uh, involved gut microbiome, and uh, also did fecal transplant and found about 535. So this is happening um, quite frequently within the United States and around the world. Um, it's quite a bit of work going on to try to understand how the gut microbiome and human microbiome can uh, modulate our, our um, disease. So uh, as I mentioned, the first speaker, Neil and um, Dr. Wang, gave a really nice setup to this that Poop is efficacious. Um, I like to think that there's magic in poop. Um, it can be highly efficacious at treating diseases. Uh, as, as Neil mentioned, however, some poop works and some doesn't. And you know, this, people are pointing this term super poopers. We don't yet know what the right poop looks like. Um, what is the thing or things that we can measure to determine if an FMT is gonna be efficacious? right now it's zero. There's nothing that we know to measure a priori that is going to determine or tell us if a, if a stool sample, if a donation is going to be efficacious or not. So the gut microbiome has been described as the most complex ecosystem on earth. It consists of live microbes and biomolecules and we need multi-omic approaches to measure this complex system. This is indeed a systems biology uh, problem. 
And uh, a lot of the woes in the microbiome field are rooted in measurement problems. So um, how do we measure fecal material? There's many ways really, but the two um, most prevalent ways are NGS-based metagenomics where we're looking at the, the DNA profile of all the bacteria. And from that, we're, we're extracting a taxonomic profile uh, to tell what bacteria are there. And the second most prevalent one probably is um, <clears throat> metabolomics. And this, this is done either using mass spectrometry or NMR, and it identifies the small molecules, metabolites, lipids, et cetera, that are present. Um, sometimes these can be quantitative, but that's, that's difficult. Um, but more importantly, these mass spec metabolomic measurements are answering the question, what are the bacteria doing? So metagenomics answers who's there, Metabolomics answers, what are they doing? In both cases, uh, there are a multitude of methodological variables that impact the results. These are hard measurements to perform. Uh, it's been demonstrated many times over that interlab reproducibility is poor. Uh, you know, I can guarantee you that if I have a poop sample and I split it in half and I send half to my colleague in Boston and then I measure the other half in my lab, we will get very different results. And that's because we're using lab specific lab adopted methods. You know, the way I extract DNA from my sample might be different than how my uh, collaborator does it. And because of that, we're gonna see different relative abundances and different um, taxonomic profiles. Okay. So there are no agreed upon standardized universal methods for measuring fecal material, as I just mentioned, it's um, lab specific. So what we need are reference materials to assess accuracy, precision, and to perform inter-lab comparisons and eventual harmonization. If we have a reference material that we know is homogeneous and stable and that we know two labs can have the exact same thing or a hundred labs can have the exact same material, we can begin to understand the extent of the methodological variability's impact on the results. And two labs might get the same answer and they say, aha, now we can compare our data that we're generating in our labs because we know our measurements are producing the same. And contrary to that, if you know two labs measure the same thing and they get strikingly different answers, they know not to really uh, try to integrate or interpret their data um, in, in a single swoop. So speaking of reference materials, NIST, you know, we're a metrology institute, the National Institute of Standards. We develop a lot of reference materials. Um, it's not all we do, but it is a big part of what we do. Um, been doing it since our foundation in 1901. Um, this is a, a snapshot of some of those materials that have been developed over the last 50, 60, 70 years. You can see that we have standard reference cigarettes. We have peanut butter. We have meat homogenate. Um, let's see, we've got sulfur and diesel fuel. We've got some industrial sludge, we've got Portland concrete. And while some of these, all of these may sound silly in some way, like why would you need that? They all have very important industrial uh, applications and we don't commit lightly to developing a reference material. So if we do develop one, we are going to do our due diligence to know that it has a very specific need within an industry. So let's consider uh, developing a fecal reference material, what that would look like. So um, people like myself say the words homogeneous and stable at least 15 times a day. A reference material, according to the international ISO definition, is a material that's homogeneous and stable, it's fit for purpose. So um, manufactured fecal material that's homogeneous and stable. And when I say stable, I mean stable for years, not for months. So we're gonna do this once and we want it to last five or six years. Um, we don't have the capacity to be, you know, remanufacturing new lots every six months. So we're gonna produce a lot of it and it's gonna you know, be that one lot many years. So um, contradictory to what I just said, poop inherently is inhomogeneous, it's heterogeneous, it's unstable. It's the worst case scenario for a reference. Um, and just so we're all on the same page, homogeneous means that the microbial taxa and the small molecule metabolites are all the same across multiple aliquots. That's what it would have to um, look like. Stable means that these metabolites and the microbial taxa don't change over time. So if I measure this material today and I get a, uh, a, a, a 
taxonomic profile, and then I measure it two years from now, that taxonomic profile should not have changed. Uh, the ideal per preservation method will leave the cells intact and the integrity of the cell wall will not change over time. You can imagine, you know, if, if the material is being stored for years, maybe the cell wall is gradually being compromised. And over that time, you might think that your DNA extraction method is just getting better. Hey, I'm getting better yields, I'm getting more richness, but it's actually the degradation of the material. So these are the types of things that we have to take into consideration and control for. Um, so how do we manufacture large quantities that are stable for years? So uh, last year, we did a feasibility study. We call it the poop pilot study. So we took some poop, we took some water, and we put it in a ninja blender and homogenized it. <clears throat> okay, so now we've got a blender full of homogenized poop. And we took some of that and we mixed it with one of these proprietary commercial stabilization buffers. These are you know, commonly available. These are the, um, the um, free agents that typically you put um, clinical samples in to keep them stable. Um, so we mixed some of our homogenized poop with this proprietary stabilization buffer, and then we made four sub aliquots of that. Okay. Uh, there's actually multiple proprietary storage buffers on the market, so we just chose another brand, did the same thing, mixed it with the storage buffer, and we made four one mil aliquots. Okay, then we took some more of the material and we just put it, you know, right as it is, as it is neat uh, at four degrees, no storage buffer. Took some of it, lyophilized it, made four replicates of that. <clears throat> and finally, you know, in water, stored at minus 80. So these are the different stabilization uh, measures that we are testing to see which, if any, uh, will actually lead to a stabilized material over, um, a uh, time frame. And also these things, these preparations have to be fit for purpose. Preparing the material, however we do it, it can't interfere with the downstream measurements in a way that would make it not have the same measurement property. So if it doesn't look like poop anymore, I mean, we could throw some bleach in there and, you know, we could really, um, you know, hit it hard with some heavy reagents, but, you know, then it wouldn't look like the the uh, biomimetic material anymore. Okay, so what did we do with those? Let's see, there's um, four times five is uh, 20 aliquots um, that cover five different preservation methods. So we let it sit in the fridge for four months <clears throat> or at minus 80 because one of them was stored at minus 80. And then after the, we stored for four months, we did four types of measurements. We did um, metabolomics, um, I'm sorry, uh, we did metagenomic measurements, so we did DNA extractions, and we taxonomic profiled the material. Uh, we did NMR-based metabolomics. We did uh, uh, gas chromat chroma chromatography-based uh, metabolomics, and we did liquid chromatography-based metabolomics, okay? So these are assessing whether or not this material is amenable to these types of measurements. And um, I'm just going to give you a uh, high level overview of what we found. So this is the metagenomic data. So this is the taxonomic profile we found and it's plotted in a uh, 2D um, PicoA plot of uh, Bray Curtis distance. And what you can see is that the different preservation methods all seem to cluster together, which means each preservation method gave its own unique taxonomic profile. And this one that was the material stored at four degrees was most different from all of them. And we surmised that at four degrees, the bacteria are still alive and there's food and poop and I would presume they're just, you know, eating the, you know, the nutrients and they're probably metabolizing and growing. And um, so that's probably why that shifted away from the rest. But even, you know, within the rest, you can see that there's distinct um, subclusters that um, represent the different preservation methods. Okay, so let's look at some of the metabolomics data. This is the GC metabolomics data. This is the, you call it a uh, metabolomic profile. Um, here are some of the compounds that were identified. And if you look closely, what I'm showing here is that there are four traces overlapping each other. And these are for one of the preparation, one of the stabilization methods, the four biological replicates. So what it means is within a preservation method, whichever one we choose, we see great homogeneity. They're indistinguishable within a preservation method. But you look across preservation methods, different preservation methods get starkingly different metabolomic profiles. So 
Um, it's a sort of a, uh, a storage specific profile. And those were reproducible. That is, you know, that's different profile from the different storage method. It was reproducible within that method. Okay, go on. Uh, this is um, just a 2D PCOA of the GC mass spec data, the one I showed you previously. Uh, that was GC, yeah. Um, same sort of thing. Um, there are some unexpected findings here. So, um, you know, from the metagenomic data, the taxonomic profile, we saw the four degree material appeared to have deviated most from the rest. And in this case, the four degree material uh, clusters uh, indistinguishably with um, the minus 80 material. So, uh, you know, we're measuring apples and oranges here, metabolites versus taxa. So uh, very different measurements, but that was an interesting finding and we have some thoughts on why that might be. Okay, and uh, I mentioned that we did um, LC mass spec and also NMR. Uh, it is the same story. We saw great homogeneity within a preservation method, but we saw different metabolic profiles across preservation methods. But more importantly with what I want to point out here is that these two giant peaks that you see in the LC mass spectra and these two giant, uh, these double giant peaks you see over here, these are the signals from those proprietary storage buffers and they dramatically interfered with the signal that we're trying to extract from it. So I'm not an NMR expert or an LC mass spec expert, but we do have, you know, some of the world's best there and they're explaining to me that, you know, this this isn't um, feasible to use these proprietary storage buffers. They may work well for DNA-based uh, nucleic acid storage methods in downstream, but they don't work for um, metabolomic measurements because they have such a high concentration of um, you know, the, the surfactants and salts and theotropic agents that uh, allow it to be um, a, stable, a stabilizer. Okay, so conclusions from that. Um, Nothing that you didn't hear me uh, just say. So each preservation method produced a unique metabolic and taxonomic profile. Uh, within a preservation method, the four biological replicates were sufficiently homogeneous. So that means our manufacturing process produces sufficient, sufficiently homogeneous material. <clears throat> and remember, you know, stool by itself is inherently uh, unstable. So um, these proprietary storage buffers are not fit for purpose. Uh, they interfere with the mass spec measurements. Uh, for reasons that I had already mentioned. And uh, by the way, we also know that some of those uh, storage buffers, they lyse the bacterial cells, and we don't want that. We want the cells to be intact because when you do metagenomic measurements, the first step is to do a DNA extraction, and you have to challenge that extraction step. You need those cells intact. <clears throat> um, so out of those five, what did we find? We found that the lyophilized, lyophilized material and that material that was stored at minus 80 seemed um, quite promising moving forward. And uh, the last thing I'm gonna mention, I kept mentioning stability, but I'm sure some of you uh, probably caught on to this. What I just described wasn't a true stability study because we didn't take a time equals zero uh, measurement. Um, we prepared the material, we put it in a refrigerator for four months and then we measured it once. So there was no T equals zero. But despite that, you could see that uh, we were able to uh, gain some insight from, from this pilot study. So um, let's flash forward to 2020. Let's do a true stability study. And we're ramping up our, our confidence and our efforts here. So in this case, we've recruited two, two cohorts, uh, omnivores and vegans. Uh, it was rather irrelevant uh, what the cohorts were. We chose these because we rationalized that these, the fecal material from these donors would be most different because your diet impacts your gut microbiome um, um, uh, um, quite severely. So we just wanted starkly different um, samples. <clears throat> so um, from these cohorts, we collected their uh, fecal material, we uh, pooled it, we homogenized it, and we made um, over a thousand aliquots of it. Um, I mentioned before that we found that lyophilization and storage at minus 80 was most promising. So half of these were lyophilized and the other half were at minus 80. Um, here are some of our NIST scientists working with scientists from the Bio Collective, which is a stool repository that we work very closely with in, in helping uh, develop these manufacturing processes. 
Um, you know, you can see here is a ninja blender, and if you look closely, you can see some raw fecal material there, actual stool, um, you know, the hom homogenization process, there's filtration steps, etc. <clears throat> so my uh, cartoon representation of just a blender is uh, quite um, uh, inaccurate. Come on. So um, let's flash forward to March 2020. Uh, as I just showed you, we were able earlier this year to successfully manufacture over a thousand aliquots of fecal material that represent uh, vegan and omnivore cohorts. Uh, now we're ready to start our 18 months stability study. Uh, we are going to take our T equals zero time point using multi omic measurements, and we had planned to do you know a year, year and a half uh, time course study on this to really uh, drill down and look at, you know at individual molecules, metabolites, and ask you know there's a lot of volatile compounds in food. You know, and do these things volatilize over time? Um, so these are these are the types of uh, questions we were asking. Uh, however, um, something happened. It was called a pandemic. And before, after we manufactured the material, but before we could take these time points, we were sent home. So essentially, we missed our TQA zero time point. Um, <clears throat> uh, Sabine had asked me to talk about some of our COVID-related work. Um, I'm going to shift gears here a little bit, but really it's, it's, it's the same thread. Uh, while when we were sent home, um, like every other scientist in the world, we were asked to think about how we can respond to this pandemic. And um, one of the articles I saw early on, I think Sabine actually sent it to me, it showed that this virus was being shed into fecal material. And, you know, I, light went off in my head. I said, well, we have fecal material and they're going to be testing for COVID and fecal material and they're going to need reference materials to, you know, assess, to validate and um, do interlab studies, etc. So um, the fact that SARS-CoV-2 is shed in fecal material uh, created some unique opportunities and challenges that we are uh, trying to exploit right now. Uh, so one of those is fecal microbiome transplantation safety. Um, Obviously, if a donor unknowingly has COVID-19, uh, they could provide a, a, a FMT material that's, um, it, that's contaminated with uh, COVID. And of course, that could lead to fecal oral uh, route of transmission. And um, this was uh, pretty obvious um, early on uh, in the pandemic in March, the FDA actually released a safety alert addressing this. And they basically said any FMT material that had been donated as of January has to start has to be screened for SARS-CoV-2. Makes sense. Um, so now you're going to have to develop molecular assays that need to be validated in this challenging material. So, you know, a lot of these commercial, hundreds of commercial, you know, COVID diagnostics have been developed, but they've all been developed and validated for nasal swabs. So how do they perform in fecal material? And um, we really don't know that. So um, you have to figure that out. So we need fecal reference materials. And uh, we have to be in the right place at the right time and have um, a lot of that on hand. And the second way we started thinking about things, and I'm sure you've heard this on the news, it's, uh, it's quite uh, interesting and it's really an international uh, push, is to start uh, uh, environmental biosurveillance, so monitoring sewage and wastewater treatment plants. Um, <clears throat> so, of course, um, the fecal material that you flush down your toilet ends up in a uh, wastewater treatment plant somewhere. You can measure. Uh, community-wide levels of COVID-19 and the rise and fall, and um, some of the experts say that you know this is an early warning system. It's a forecasting system, and uh, this type of visibility would allow uh, public health experts to predict the second wave of outbreaks. Uh, again, um, sewage and wastewater is is not fecal material, but it's um, not too far from it. So um, we rationalized that our fecal material could be used. Um, in this way as well to help that group uh, begin to validate and standardize measurements for measuring SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater. Uh, <clears throat> early on when the pandemic hit, uh, one of our, my colleagues at NIST, Peter Vallone, he was tasked with um, getting back in the lab and developing a SARS-CoV-2 reference material. This, and they, they did a fantastic job and cranked it out in a couple of months. This is freely available now, you can get it um, by uh, going on the NIST website. But basically, it's naked RNA in a tube. It's just two fragments of RNA that represent two pieces of the SARS-CoV-2 genome. Uh, these happen to be the regions of the genome where the, most of the qPCR assays are developed, of course. So 
it's designed to assess the analytical performance of two PCR assays that have been um, developed to measure SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we also have a lot of human fecal material on hand that we feel confident is homogeneous. And um, we, uh, thought, hey, um, sounds kind of uh, uh, risky, dangerous, but let's try a spike experiment where we take some of this NIST uh, synthetic RNA and we spike it into the fecal material. And we did that um, for about 20 spike samples compared to 20 non-spike samples. And it worked. We were very surprised to see that. Uh, I was pretty sure that the RNA was going to degrade as soon as it got in the presence of the fecal material because the fecal material is going to have active nucleases, et cetera. And I thought it was just going to chew the RNA right up, but it actually survived for a week and uh, was still able to be measured. So um, that seems promising. Uh, you know, we're imagining a, um, you know, a NIST material that is poop and RNA and you get it in your lab and you spike one and the other and now you have your um, control material. And um, NIST uh, previously this was uh, decades ago, uh, but helped develop a standard for synthetic wastewater. Um, here are the ingredients, include flowers, uh, I'm sorry, flour, ocean salts, and beer. They actually use Bud Light, uh, just FYI. Um, but we can make synthetic wastewater in the lab. Um, and you, know, you can imagine that <clears throat> for this community, we can begin to do spikes again, or uh, rather we can hand the community these materials and allow them to do spikes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm finishing up here. I don't know if I'm over on my time. Um, yeah, you're a little bit over, but please finish. Okay. Um, so we had a webinar uh, in June to discuss this with the stakeholder community. Uh, it was a webinar on measuring SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater and fecal material. Um, there were about 475 people attended from all over the world. As I said, this is an international effort and everybody's asking for standards because everybody measures it differently at their wastewater treatment facility and therefore none of the data is intercomparable. So um, we're developing a workshop report. It'll be out in a month or two. If you're interested in reading about it, uh, we have subject matters, experts come in and talk about it and uh, re really learned a lot. Um, and I'm going to finish. Uh, NIST always has um, postdoc opportunities available. Our programs run through the NRC. It's a very competitive process, but it's a very prestigious project, uh, um, process. Uh, our NRC postdocs go on to do great things, including winning Nobel Prizes and becoming the director of NIST. Um, so if you have any talented PhD students, please send them our way. Scott, why don't you go back one slide and show about the, the what's available, you're making available the Interlay, yeah, I think you should mention this. This is important. Okay. Um, so initially when we, the, the initial reason for making the fecal reference material was as a gut microbiome reference material for multi-omic measurements. And just because we're deviating on this COVID road doesn't mean we're giving up on our initial um, um, goals and our, you know, our, our stakeholders needs. So um, with this, thousands of aliquots of fecal material we currently have on hand. We are hosting a um, metabolomics, fecal metabolomics interlab study. We're currently recruiting. Um, if you just, the URL is at the bottom. If you're interested in, um, in um, participating, you can sign up for it. It's free of charge. We'll send you about 12 or 14 poop samples. And we ask that you perform metabolomic measurements and send that data back to us, and it's going to be an uh, you know an interlab harmonization, and everyone's measurements are going to produce slightly different results, and identify different compounds, and it's going to be um, very interesting to see what we find. So, um, yeah, if um, you, okay, yeah, if you haven't copied the URL. Just Google NIST uh, microbiome metabolomics, and you'll find it. Okay, we've had a very talented team, a diverse team, everything from analytical chemists to uh, biomedical engineers and, and everything in between. And that's really what has made this project fun and successful. And uh, these people highlighted in red are from the Bio Collective. Uh, it's, a bio, it's a stool repository that we've worked with and they have been 100% um, helpful in um, working out manufacturing processes for uh, these fecal materials. And uh, I'll stop with that.
Okay, thank you very much, Scott. <clears throat> that, that was terrific and a very important area that needs to be continually evaluated. Yeah. I, I will take a mention right now, I, I don't know if, if, for those of you who get Netflix, there's a series called Connections, and episode two is on poop, and I would urge you to watch it if you get Netflix, it's worth doing it. Uh, uh, but, but Scott, so this is a little bit outside of what you presented, but what do you feel about standardization of specific microorganisms? Do you think there's a place for that? And how should that be done? Or, or in other words, I'm talking about how much genetic diversity is, uh, you know, can be uh, accepted. Um, what are your overall thoughts, given you, you have the broad perspective of standardization? I think there are reference strains, there are type strains, you know, Microbiologists over you know, the last hundred years have developed like a typing strategy, and there's a you know a pretty strict definition of what a type string means. Uh, I think that's the best we can do because you know 20 years ago people thought if you had a strain of E. coli, you just had a strain of E. coli, right. and all E. coli was E. coli. And right. now we know that every strain of E. coli is different than the next, and it's sort of this infinite level of um, of diversity. So. I think the best we can do is um, identify strains that represent the various clades that are um, that these isolates, you know, naturally evolve into, and pick representatives from those. Um, I think that's about the best we can do, and um, I know some efforts have already gone to do that. <clears throat> Rob Knight and others. Um, yeah, and you know this whole taxon taxonomy thing. You know, as Neil mentioned, you know, all we're doing is saying the name of a strain and how is right, that right. supposed to be something that's actionable you know yeah it's like saying my name is scott and that's supposed to mean something just because of the name like um we need better ways of describing what the microbes are that we're measuring rather than just stating their name which is <laughs> i think so because the genus lactobacillus contains organ and i think it's been many of them have been recently renamed because the genus was so diverse that uh, having them all named lactobacillus was was considered inappropriate. Yes. So when, when you characterize the, the, the uh, samples, do you also include the fungome and the virome? Well, we do shotgun metagenomics mostly. Um, so that includes everything except for the RNA viruses. Um, sometimes we do 16S, so we don't capture that because we don't right. um, we don't typically do the ITS uh, that's done for the fungi. Um, so yes, we see it through the metagenomics that we do. And what do you consider your biggest challenges in the future? Oh, I, you know, getting everyone to, um, Getting everyone to perform measurements the same way, that is to adopt a standardized method that everyone is using, that would allow international harmonization of all this data. And you know, just like um, you know, Dr. Wang pointed out with the, the cancer studies, those three studies, they all found different strains to be right. what appeared to be the, you know, the uh, efficacious strain. I guarantee you that's a measurement problem. That's um, you know, platform-specific, protocol-specific bias that they're seeing. Um, if everyone was on the same page doing the exact same measurements using the same protocols, then we would have international harmonization. But on the other side of that, and you know, this is the caveat, is that standardization um, stifles innovation. If everyone is doing the same thing, they're not being innovative. So we have to balance that innovation and standardization. And there's a really a time and place for both. You know, in, in a clinical diagnostic setting, there's no room for innovation. You do it the way you're supposed to do it every time. But in a research environment, you know, you, that's where innovation is born. So, um, but that's also where the same research is being done. So, um, And how much does your standardization, you think, will be biased by the location, you know, the, where the person actually lives that provides samples and the sex of the person? So how much variable do you think there'll be in all of that that will make standardization broadly diff more even more difficult um i don't know how I, I don't see demographics being a source of bias in that 
um, what I see is, you know, once the stool hits the collection tube, that's when it starts. And, um, you know, if we can standardize collection methods, you know, at home, um, you know, um, sometimes these uh, at-home testing kits, they just want a, uh, you know, a, a cotton swab of um, stool and others ask for whole stool. And, you know, I can guarantee you, if you measure both of those, you're not going to get the same result. Um, so, yeah, you know, another, you know, phrase that I say six times a day is that there's bias in every step of the measurement process from how you collect your sample to how you interpret your data and everything in between. And there are a lot of things in between. Um, the, the metagenomic analysis tools that we use, they're called taxonomic profiling tools. And there are these bioinformatic tools that are developed by academics, Kraken, Metaflan, you know, these usual suspects. Uh, a colleague of mine and I um, tracked down all of the various taxonomic profiling tools that have been developed by academics in the last 10 years or so, and we found over 100. There are over 100 different software tools designed to do the same thing, that is taxonomic profile, your metagenomic data. They all use different algorithms. They use different statistical assumptions. They, many of them use different reference databases, and they will all give you a different answer from the same raw FASTQ file. You take one raw FASTQ file and you give it to these 100 different people using 100 different software, and they're gonna get very different answers. And that's just one step of the measurement process. No. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think we'll move on to the next talk. And I wanna remind the audience that there